In June 1850, Nathaniel Beverly Tucker, the chairman of the law school at the College of William and Mary, made his way from Williamsburg, Virginia to Nashville to attend a regional convention. Called to discuss ways the South could resist growing Northern hostility to slavery, the convention gave Tucker a chance to promote his preferred remedy, secession in a Southern Confederacy, to a wider and more influential audience than he was used to lecturing in the classroom. In the words of historian Eric H. Walter, Tucker believed he faced a rendezvous with destiny. He desperately sought an appointment with the Virginia delegation, feeling the blood of my ancestors stir within him at the thought of leading a revolution. If he could assume a leading role in the proceedings, future generations would remember that in the struggle for Southern freedom, one of the first blows struck was mine. It was hoped that the Nashville Convention would achieve the elusive goal of Southern unity long sought by Senator John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Summarizing his view, historian William J. Cooper writes, party divided the South and turned its attention away from the critical issue of abolition and the oncoming deluge. Parties in the South, as Calhoun saw them, had no commitment to principle. The exclusive object of both parties in electing the president is to obtain the spoils. They are both equally ready to sacrifice any other consideration. Because of the trammels of party, he lamented, our people have been lulled into a false security by party papers and party leaders on both sides who take a far deeper interest in the result of a presidential election than in what relates to the safety and interest of the South. Proof of Calhoun's point seemed to lie in the disappointing results of elevating General Zachary Taylor of Louisiana, a Whig, in the wake of the Mexican-American War and the United States' acquisition of a vast expanse of territory. The North was as hell-bent on keeping slavery, and free blacks as well, out of the conquered land as the South was on letting slaveholders take their property out West. And to Southerners' horror, electing one of their own to the presidency had actually backfired when Taylor, even though he was a slave owner, announced his plan to let California bypass the territorial stage and promptly be admitted as a free state. The same looked likely to happen with the New Mexico Territory. Northern domination seemed to loom on the horizon. So it looked like good news for Calhoun when, in October 1849, a bipartisan Mississippi convention called for the 1850 Nashville Convention, representing all the slaveholding states, to deliver an ultimatum to the North. But the very convention that was supposed to undermine the two-party system in the South soon found itself undermined by that very system and the proposed Compromise of 1850, which would also admit California as a free state, but in exchange for concessions to the South like a tougher fugitive slave law. Cooper explains that, the Southern Democrats took the Nashville Convention as their own. It seemed like an appropriate forum for their increasingly shrill shouts about the South's need to protect herself. They were not breaked by the hope that their president would turn the slavery issue to their advantage, a hope still very much alive among Southern Whigs in late 1849. If the Southern Democrats could successfully equate the Nashville Convention with the safety of the South, they could increase the political pressure on the already burdened Southern Whigs. Of course, the Southern Democrats would have been delighted to have their Whig opponents join their crusade. And to that end, they urged the Southern Whigs to come along. But when Henry Clay stepped forward with his compromise, the possibility of Southern unity evaporated. In embracing Clay's compromise, Southern Whigs turned against the Nashville Convention. Seizing the compromise as a political platform that would stand in the South, they had little interest in heading for Nashville, where they would only be a part of the Democratic team. In their rhetoric, Nashville became a synonym for an uncalled for radicalism, for nullification, for secession. Southern Democrats found themselves in an unpleasant situation. Instead of pressuring their Whig opponents and leading a united South, they found themselves forced to defend both their politics and their convention. Simultaneously, they emphatically and truthfully denied that they were disunionists and that the Nashville Convention would break up the Union. Of course, some of the Nashville delegates, especially in the South Carolina delegation, hoped for just such an outcome. Robert Barnwell Rhett had been a protege of Calhoun, who died of tuberculosis a few months before the convention, but unlike Calhoun, he preferred secession as a first resort rather than a last one. 
But when Rhett arrived in Nashville, he found that the momentum was already sputtering, writes Rhett biographer William C. Davis. In spite of declaring in 1849 that passage of anything like the Wilmot Proviso would result in its secession, Virginia did not even send a full delegation, and there was rather an air of trepidation now that they were actually attempting to meet. Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, North Carolina, and even Louisiana sent no delegations at all, and Florida, Alabama, Arkansas, and Tennessee sent only informal delegations with no official state sanction. In such a ticklish atmosphere, Rhett and Francis Pickens argued that their delegation should speak up and take the lead, but the rest of the South Carolinians wisely decided to stay calm and as quiet as possible in the deliberations for fear of being too ultra and frightening the others into abandoning the effort. They convened on June 3rd at the Odd Fellows Hall, but soon found it too small and adjourned to a nearby church and they promptly set about dropping so much cigar ash and tobacco juice that they would have to replace the carpet when they adjourned. In the end, the church getting new carpet was perhaps the most tangible outcome of the convention. Rhett wrote an address denouncing Henry Clay's proposed compromise and accusing the North of laying the groundwork for total abolition, but read the room well enough to have one of the Alabama delegates introduce it for him. After days of much talk but little action, the convention adjourned, but not before Nathaniel Beverly Tucker spoke for an hour to the horror of weary delegates who just wanted to go home. In the words of historian David S. Heidler, pathos unwittingly fed on itself for Tucker at Nashville because what he had envisioned as his and the South's finest hour was to be only an embarrassing afterthought to a meaningless event. He painted a glorious portrait of a Southern Confederacy and prophesied a lovelier domino theory of secession than anyone like Rhett could have imagined in his wildest dreams. Although citing an anti-Southern conspiracy in Congress, Tucker declared that cotton was too valuable for the North to lose with the war. The formation of a Southern Confederacy would occur in peace because of Northern discretion. Tucker grew so excited that he forged leaden fantasies and made them soar like eagles. Illinois, Ohio, and Indiana would wish to join the South. He saw Pennsylvania coming into the Confederation, and then Cuba and Santo Domingo. Jamaica would join as well, he shouted, adding that England would not object. He shocked the pretty women in the galleries by maintaining that the binding together of these diverse entities would be as joyous as a union like that of the sexes. Tucker died the following year, resigned to the reality that secession wasn't coming soon, but optimistic nonetheless. He wrote a friend, the open discussion of the question of disunion and the clear admission that disunion is not the worst of possible evils and that union is a means, not an end, place us far in advance of any position heretofore occupied. As for Rhett, he did live to help usher in South Carolina secession near the end of 1860 and to participate in forming the new Confederacy. But the ink had barely dried on the new constitution before he felt practically as disgusted by the new government as by the old one. Be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.